Well, I was very pleased uh, to be asked to contribute an essay to Alan's face shrift, and of course very happy to be invited to speak this afternoon. Like every historian of British Unitarianism, I'm in debt to Alan for his many articles, but especially for his collections of Unitarian biographies and obituaries he's compiled, as will become obvious both in what I am to say this afternoon and if you read my essay. For about 30 years now, I've been interested in dissenting academies and their role in training students for the ministry. Much of my work has focused on Manchester College, both because of the quality of the college records and because of its role in training Unitarian ministers. And it would be appropriate for me here to express my thanks to the principal and fellows for making the college records so freely available, and also to the librarians of the college for their help, and in particular to Sue Kaloran, the most outstanding of a succession of outstanding college librarians. Those of us who work on Unitarian history have been remarkably fortunate in this respect. My article in Transactions looks at both the opportunities that were available to students who wanted to train for the Unitarian ministry in the early 19th century, that is, what colleges were open to them, but also the consequences of what it is clear was a failure to train enough ministers. If we look at the growth of dissent during the 18th and 19th centuries, we gain a sense of the demand for ministers and perhaps also the important role ministers played in this growth. English Presbyterians from about 600 uh, congregations were reduced to about 200 by 1800. This is largely a result of the loss of rural uh, meetings, uh, but of course uh, of this 200, they are immensely wealthy, uh, Cross Street, uh, Manchester High Payment, Nottingham, uh, Renshaw Street, um, uh, Liverpool, and, and so on. And indeed, they are, are the congregations that really give dissent its strength and its importance. But what is much more striking are the 200 or so uh, Congregationalist congregations in 1715, and this is from the evidence list at Dr. Williams' library, to 900 plus by 1800, to 2,000 by 1831, and a staggering 3,200 uh, by 1851. And this growth, it doubles in, in a decade, uh, in these decades here, is absolutely astonishing. And that, perhaps, is what we should compare ourselves with uh, if we want to know the success of Unitarianism in the 19th century. And here I'm being controversial, of course. Yeah. Um, um, what, of course, is, is remarkable uh, is that we have, uh, uh, at the end of 1800, I'm not going to talk today about the process, how these become Unitarian, but by and large, the wealthy urban congregations become Unitarian, uh, but were Presbyterian in the 18th century. And th there are about as many gains as there are losses. A major feature, of course, and the reason uh, for this uh, growth, uh, this staggering growth here, and Baptists are similar 1850s, they're around the 2000 mark, um, is, of course, the evangelical revival, which largely passes us by. <coughs> I owe this uh, uh, quotation to Alan, of course. I'm not one to expect that the Unitarian denomination will ever acquire a strong hold or exercise a wide influence over the uneducated masses of English society. <laughs> but I do anticipate that we may exercise a great, and if we are faithful to our position, an increasing influence upon the men of the largest culture and most in advance of the age. I think it far better policy to work with, with, with that vein of society than to attempt to compete with the popular sex. Could only be Martin, of course. <laughs> And nor was he alone. This is Joseph Hunter, uh, antiquarian, a uh, singularly unsuccessful minister at Bath. Uh, he pretty well preached his congregation away. Uh, Unitarian missions and missionaries are use as useless and, as, and worse as degrading to the Unitarian cause. <laughs> So historians, uh, particularly of uh, our, our, the historians of the Orthodox denominations, have accused Unitarian ministers of preaching away their congregations with their dry, rationalistic sermons. And indeed, there could be no surprise to them that Unitarian congregations were so singularly unsuccessful. Uh, Bridlington, Zion Chapel, um, uh, was, uh, was Presbyterian for much of the 18th century, but later the chapel became independent, perhaps around 1770, when the views of an Aryan minister caused dissension amongst the congregation. Pontifract, um, he went into the Sicinian scheme. It is said he found a respectable congregation and preached it away. And there are, are lots of other uh, examples of this. But is this actually true? 
Richard Wright and the Unitarian Fund demonstrate it was possible for Unitarians to recruit large numbers of new adherents. Wright and, and, and a small number of other missionaries preached, uh, preachers enjoyed remarkable success as itinerant preachers in the early decades of the 19th century. They obtained new recruits from poor or less educated audiences as a result of their dogmatic anti-Trinitarian preaching in which they attacked fundamental orthodox beliefs, particularly in the Trinity. And there were plenty of people who would respond to that. When you actually look, and I've done a, a, quite a detailed study of Yorkshire, of the 50 or so English Presbyterian congregations at the beginning of the 18th century, wondering what happens to them by the end of the 19th. And when you actually begin to look at the detail, it's a little bit different. Samuel Lucas, um, minister of Morley Old Chapel, which is now a suburb of Leeds, um, it was supposed that Mr. Lucas never went uh, the length of most Presbyterian ministers in understanding the points of doctrine. This rendered him acceptable to the moderate part of the congregation at Morley and tolerable to the Orthodox. Now, what is generally argued is that those who became Arian or, or Unitarian preached away their congregations. We've had that. But actually, when you begin to look at the detail, it seems a little bit different. Um, his replacement was a, a Calvinist, a Scotsman, brought in by the Orthodox party on the removal of Lucas. Look, he only lasts a year. <laughs> look at William Duncan. Not much better, after an unsuccessful pastorate, partly caused by the Unitarian sentiments, prevalent in the now small congregation, he retired in 1815. Abraham Hudswell, eventually, you know, by, by persistence by the Orthodox, um, educated to idol, which is a good clue as to his orthodoxy, his plain, earnest, effective ministry rallied the congregation and re-established evangelical sentiments. So what is happening is I and this is, I think, the real factor, is that we're not producing enough ministers in the 18th century. If we had been able to get a, success, a Presbyterian successor to Lucas, I think, you know, what we would have continued to hold uh, Morley. And Thomas Spencer, you know, when they do bring in a, a Calvinist, is unpopular. He's unpopular with those who are much more sympathetic to rational descent and to Unitarianism. So I think, you know, we've got it wrong. And you can look here uh, at Mixenden and Oveden, uh, which you probably never even heard of, uh, but was a Presbyterian congregation. And uh, again, it's the same uh, thing here. Uh, Scots Calvinist, uh, last two years in succession to Daniel Jones. John Bates is popular because he isn't a Calvinist. David Howard, last three years. Uh, Bates comes back again and eventually, look what about this about Clarkson was invited, finally decided to apply to Idol Academy. And there are example of this after example. When we actually begin to look in the early 19th century, we actually find lots of comments about the lack of ministers. Um, this is, uh, we don't know who TM is from York, want of zeal and new returns, the monthly repository says, never was a more general want of ministers. Many societies have been dissolved on this account and others are likely to be dissolved if nothing be done shortly. Joseph Hunter. Gordon and Morley, who we've just seen, are both lost from the want of a regular supply of ministers. And at this time, there are no less than five places in the north of England which have been for some time destitute. Charles Wellbeloved, principal of Manchester College, York, told the treasurer, and to repeated applications, I'm obliged to return the same office. Answer, no assistance from York. Several places are now vacant, and as far as I can see, are likely to continue to be so. Now, the reason is, it's the closure of so many liberal academies. Warrington, of course, is, is, is famous amongst uh, all dissenters, um, uh, but actually uh, really close in 83, it's finally closed in 1786. Carmarthen Academy closes 84. Hoxton Academy in London closes 85. So three of the major academies, training ministers, close within a few years of each other. Daventry Academy moves to Northampton and is closed to lay students. And in fact, uh, that becomes John Hawes' academy and closes in 1798. New College Hackney, a replacement for Hoxton, but also for Warrington, lasts just 10 years. Uh, Hawes' academy is closed uh, in 1798 and replaced by the Orthodox uh, Wymanglia College. So all those colleges which had previously trained uh, ministers for English Presbyterian, rational descent and Unitarian congregations have closed. Those are the academies which are available at this period for the Orthodox. Look at the list of them. Staggering, isn't it? And those are the colleges which are available for us, for, for Unitarian. New College Manchester, 
is by 1796 is the only academy available, except for Timothy Ken uh, Kenrick's very short-lived academy down in Exeter. Uh, and then there is no other academy uh, until uh, Unitarian College uh, Missionary Board, sorry, Unitarian Home Missionary Board in 1854, with the exception of the Hackney Unitarian Academy, which was for training missionaries, not for training students. Uh, and this is the, the history of the academy. If you actually look at the numbers, it's even more striking. Uh, okay, Warrington is, has this very high reputation. It's really a dissenting university, a university without subscription. Uh, quite the largest institution amongst dissenters, 393 students in all. But look at the small proportion of divinity students. Daventry Academy, by contrast, is much, much more important for us. 182 ministerial students. And many of those uh, lay students come after Warrington Academy closes. Horsley's Academy only trains ministers. These are the, the colleges which are training our students uh, in the late 18th century. Replaced by Manchester College, 20 students. Well, that's because they can go to New College Hackney, which I haven't put on here because the information's incomplete, but uh, doesn't compare, obviously, uh, with Horsley uh, at all. And by the time of George Walker, that is the only academy open to Unitarian ministers or people training for Unitarian ministry. So the shortage of ministers is simply we're not training enough. We're not, we don't have the, the, the colleges to train them. And by 1796, this for the first time, liberal dissent it has to, is forced to rely upon a single institution, Manchester College. And I think the seriousness for Unitarians, the closure of Hackney, and especially Horses Academy at Northampton, which is the successor to Daventry, has not been fully appreciated. Both institutions educated many of the ministers who were to serve the Unitarian congregations in the first half of the 19th century, and that's a point I shall return to. If we actually look at where our ministers were, were trained, and here I'm entirely reliant upon Alan's excellent list of obituaries, where you can find out where people were ministers, and, and where they trained, etc. I've divided the, the, those who died between 1800 and 1850 into three groups. There's no way you can be any more refined than that. So those who had their ministry before 1800, those who had their ministry mainly before 1800, so let's say 20 years before 1800 and five after, and those who had all their ministry after 1800 or mainly after 1800. And the thing which is remarkable here, okay, perhaps not surprising in the 1800, is Daventry and Halsey. Look how unimportant Warrington is, and indeed New College. But look at Daventry. <coughs> Even into, the, even into the 1820s and 30s, it's still more important than the other academies. New College Manchester, okay, not very many are trained there, but only nine, the ones in bracket are those, those students who trained at more than one place, just to keep the statistics right. Uh, Manchester Co Co College York becomes more important, but even in uh, the 18, um, between up to 1850, those who ministers who've died, more have been educated at Daventry uh, at Northampton than have actually been educated at Manchester, which is the principal place. That shows you how serious it was for us to lose Horses Academy. Also look how important Carmarthen starts to become, 17 and 19. So out of a total of 427 Unitarian ministers, more than half have gone to Daventry and Northampton. And only, even by 1831, less than 25% have been to Manchester College. So where are they educated? We're not educating them. The Orthodox are. Well close in the earlier period, and then later on, I've, I've included Glasgow and Edinburgh and Oxford and Cambridge. But, you know, there are ones and twos and, and so on here. Uh, Homerton, eight. But the other striking thing is how reliant we become on the General Baptists and Methodists. So... Liberal dissent has always recruited ministers from the Orthodox dissent. And of the Unitarian ministers who died between 1800 and 1849, nine in the first group had attended an Orthodox academy, such as Placeter's Academy uh, or Homerton Academy, including four who went on to study elsewhere. But the most striking feature is of the Methodists and General Baptists. These ministers, who in general lacked any formal training for the Unitarian ministry, would not have been acceptable to an earlier generation. Instead, that anti-Trinitarianism created a, a common bond with an older Socinianism, which grew out of English Presbyterianism. And they provided a crucial influx of ministers to serve the poorer congregations who wanted popular preaching rather than scholarly sermons. So the consequences, it seems to me, for 19th century Unitarianism of the closure of the main liberal academies during the last decade of the 18th century is very clear. And I would argue 
which has a very serious impact upon the development of Unitarianism in the 19th century. And above all, I think we haven't really appreciated the significance of Northampton, Halsey's Academy at Northampton. So, if we had trained more ministers in the first part of the 19th century, could we have established more congregations? I think the answer is yes. We would have had a much more powerful force in the 19th century and early 20th century if we'd attempted to match the achievements of the Congregationists and to a less extent the Baptists. So could we have done better? Almost certainly. Should we have done better? Perhaps. Mm -hmm.